Our next guest is the Principal Secretary for Diaspora Affairs. I don't know the name of this ministry anymore. What is the ministry called, <laughs> Yes, It's a Ministry of Foreign and Diaspora Affairs. It's still that? Yes. It's, it's not the Ministry of the Prime Cabinet Secretary oh, and Ministry of... I'm so of sorry. So it's... Oh. <laughs> Foreign okay, affairs. so it's off. No, it's Office of the Prime Cabinet Secretary and Ministry of Foreign and Diaspora Affairs. Oh. It's difficult to fit on a letterhead. Oh yeah, um, but it's, uh, it's it's powerful. Okay. Yeah. So everything else, the Ministry of Foreign and Diaspora Affairs is still there. Yes. And now overseen by the Office of the Prime Cabinet Secretary. Yes, and you know that the Office of the Prime Cabinet Secretary, apart from its usual functions of coordination and so on, actually has a State Department under it called the State Department for Parliamentary Affairs. Yeah. Yes. That's run by uh, PS, my sister PS Aurelia Runo. Right. So our um, amalgamated ministry now has, has three, uh, three PS state departments, three, three state departments, and the office of the of the PCS. Okay. Yeah. Now in the state department for diaspora affairs, where mm -hmm. our guest Rosalind Jogu is, we are here because uh, a couple of days ago, was it last week? But one. Last week. It was last week. Mm -hmm. These days are flying, but I mm -hmm. just have no clue. Was yeah. was yesterday, Monday? I don't know. Last week, the State Department hosted the Diaspora Investment Conference. Yes. We'll talk about that, or what it was all about. But mm -hmm. to welcome you mm -hmm. to this conversation, seeing as you come from the Ministry of all those other things, <laughs> let's bring you back home. <laughs> this week's proverbs are from the Republic of Kenya. Oh, good. City. Mm. What's today's proverb? Today being Wednesday, mm. the 20th of uh, December. Uh, December. <laughs> wow, <Yes>. even you. <laughs> okay. I'm allowed to have senior moments. You are. Mm -hmm. yes, even if it's very brief, but <laughs> it must be them. Anyway, he who does not look ahead always remains behind. That's a proverb for today. Okay. He who does. does not look ahead always remains behind. Mm -hmm. Pierce, what's the interpretation of this one? You must look ahead to... Uh, wait, yeah, you must uh, plan, strategi strategize, um, prepare for what is coming, otherwise you will not be able to progress. Mm -hmm. I think you and your man are due. See, you can make a man and then you can Okay. Fine. Okay. Fine. Ata yeah. and Dani in a fit. Ata and Dani in a fit. fit. Mm. Yeah. You know, we, we, we tell our guests mm -hmm. this, and we, we tell our guests this because it's true. Mm -hmm. We ask you to give us your opinion. Mm -hmm. So it is impossible to be wrong. Mm. You are telling us what this proverb tells you, how it speaks to you, how it yeah. communicates to you. Yeah. And it is absolutely spot on. And it's a good time to be looking ahead to not... Uh, mm remain behind. Mm. End of mm. the year is great for both looking ahead and mm. reflecting mm. on where we've come from as we, we plan the uh, the year after after the week of uh, Christmas and New Year's. And all those mm -hmm. things that yeah. happen in between. Yes. The blur that's between now <laughs> yes. and school fees. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and December with its five weekends. Yes. Yes. And then January with its 17 yes. months within. <laughs> yes. The, tell us about this Diaspora Investment Conference. What was it all about? Good. So the Diaspora Investment Conference was the first time we were hosting, at least since uh, the inception of the State Department, we were hosting our first big event here in Nairobi. All of our events so far have been in the Diaspora, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but the Diaspora Investment Conference sought to bring together Diasporians who are home for Christmas and the blur that follows. Um, to have conversations with private sector, with government, with government institutions at national and county levels, and the various uh, bureaucracies or infrastructure that has been put in place for investment. So we brought together into the room through panels, through discussions, through exhibitions and so on, uh, various opportunities for diaspora to understand what are the investment opportunities back home. The idea was not so much to do our usual pitch of you should invest at home because it's great and it's um, safe and it's profitable. We also wanted them to see real tangible places where they can put money in, um, in investment. So we had panels on real estate, which is, I think, a low-hanging fruit and some of the most traditional places where diasporians have put their money. Uh, we had panels on 
financial services. We had panels on uh, capital markets and the NSC and so on. We had panels on fintechs and startups who even did pitches about their own businesses to attract diaspora funding. Um, and then we had uh, a really exciting panel from county governments that sort of talked about the investment opportunities within the counties. Mm. So that if you come from uh, Nyamira or you come from Transoia or you come from Meru and you want to think about how can I invest in you know a specific place what does what is Mary looking for what is Makueni looking for and then invest in the places that matter to you um, so we had that and, and the counties you know sort of brought their uh, investment profile and, and portfolios and, and, and people engaged at that level um, we had a fantastic trip to Konza, Technopolis, where, you know, diaspora sort of saw what, what investment opportunities lie there. Mm. And a lot of good conversations happened. So really the job was to put out a marketplace of all of the available, or a taste, of the available opportunities for investment mm. um, and, and start really good conversations. So one of the things that stood out to me, for example, was somebody from tourism came and said, um, Diaspora, we think there are these important investment opportunities in tourism that haven't been explored and we think you're the right fit to be mm. able to invest in those. We don't have any underwater activities in the sense of, you know, an undersea walk mm. or an aquarium or that kind of thing. This is an opportunity for you to put money in. We are now moving closer and closer towards adventure tourism, for example. Um, I understand the Ministry of Tourism now tells us that the average age of the tourists coming to Kenya is anything between 24 and 40. We are moving away from seeing the older sort of tourists coming in um, in a large way, I think probably because of COVID or, you know, uh, what that has meant. So what are the different places diaspora can invest, uh, not yeah, just for national yeah. development, but also so they can make a good, a good return? Somebody's asking, mm -hmm. why host this diaspora conference in Kenya? Mm -hmm. Excellent question. You could also host it in diaspora, but that means about 190 different countries, right? Mm. So, so hosting it <laughs> in Nairobi and hosting it in December was strategic because we have a number of diasporians coming home uh, for Christmas. So we took advantage of that. Um, but also we, the opportunities are here. The investment opportunities are here. And we wanted it to be easy for big business, small businesses to be able to exhibit them, for us to be able to take the field trip that we were able to take and so on. Uh, in the coming year, we expect to hold smaller expos in certain markets in the diaspora, where now we take this show to them. Okay. That usually does come with certain complications, of course, because it's, it's expensive for the businesses to travel sometimes or they're not able to do their big pitch. You can't do um, um, road trips and, and, and so on. And, and, and very often people want to see mm. and touch and experience what it is that they are uh, investing in, yep. which is why something like the Konza trip was so important because they sat there, they listened to the pitch from Konza, they saw the investments that have already been put up, they saw the infrastructure, they experienced it. Mm. And there was a lot of, uh, you know, buy-in after that, a number of them were asking, can we just get our own sort of corner yeah. where we can sort of, you know, buy uh, space and invest in that and so on. So, so yes, um, I, I see that immediately, why are you holding a diaspora conference um, in capital, mm. but because we want them to invest here yeah. in capital and we, we wanted them to come come home but we did it was a hybrid conference mm -hmm. so we had uh we had 2400 2, participants mm -hmm. uh a number of those were here in nairobi uh and then a number attended virtually mm -hmm. yeah what landed mm -hmm. for this conference in terms of what you say at why would you then say that it worked or that it was a success mm -hmm. what would they say as a result of this, the further action then mm -hmm. was for you to say, okay, yeah, this kind of thing works. Okay. So the signups were huge, mm -hmm. right? So the numbers that actually showed up uh, home in person mm -hmm. um, were significant. There was a lot of participation from, uh, from people back home. Mm -hmm. But the conversations, the questions, the answers, the engagement with the panelists, whether in person or virtually, was also quite quite heavy mm. the um, 
pick the conversations we're now picking up just after that uh, also show us that we've had a success. So we came up with um, what we're calling the Nairobi Declaration, and it's still being cleaned up, but it's largely around being able to hold this again, you know, regularly, but also putting some of the feedback was, can you, you've given us such fantastic information. We did mm. not know this stuff, or it's really good to hear all of this. Can you put it for us in one space yeah. where we can find it right now i'm looking for information somewhere on can invest or i'm finding information on this portal or on the diaspora website or da, 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 da. can you put all of that together and going forward the diaspora investment office then is going to be able to to put that information together so mm. people can see that so that was very successful the president did the opening uh, of the of the conference. It was, you know, really elevated um, the conference. So it was it was lovely. And not only did he open, so he was supposed to come and do, you know, the usual, and then do his remarks or his keynote address, and then go. Mm. When I walked him through the program, he said, "No, I want to engage a little more. I'll do my keynote, but can I be part of one of these panels?" Mm. So he joined one of the panels impromptu and we had to tell the moderator that, you know, the president now is part of your panel and, you know, um, mix that up a little bit. Mm. And he joined in a panel. So it was it was very good that way. people got to ask him questions and they got to to get answers and he got to give directions on the spot on some of the things. Um, and then it was closed by the deputy president as well, who was f fantastic. And he spoke to the diaspora in a way that I think that really resonated. Mm. Um, then we had a fantastic dinner. At the end of it, uh, on the Friday night, I left people on the dance floor at about 10 p.m. I, I think I saw footage going for another few hours <laughs> after that. It was it was wonderful to just see people come home and dance. And annoying. Uh, just kujiachilia. Mm. It was fantastic. So the success yeah. metrics would be from from the conversation that that picks up after this. Yes. Right. Yes. How are you able to measure that? That's an excellent question. And I think that's something we need to figure out a little more. So for us, tracking um, from the various exhibitors who came, uh, we'll then be able to know. I was able to get I was able to get financing uh, out of this. And you know, some of these things are a little less linear than that. It's because I had this conversation with someone who sent me to da -da -da and so on. And so some of it is a little bit difficult. Yeah. Um, the measurement might be harder. On our part, in terms of GOK, the things that they have asked us to do, those are easier to do. Set up this kind of portal, set mm -hmm. up this webinar. They've asked us for other you know, meetings and so on. Those are easy to see. Now, we should be able to see if there is investment, we should be able to tell it on our remittance numbers mm -hmm. very quickly. Mm. So we already are about 14% uh, up on remittance numbers, although the no November numbers are not in. So I'm speaking of uh, August 2022 to August 2023. That's, that shows about a 14% increase in our remittances. Mm. Um, soon we'll have the November numbers and then we'll be able to tell what, what the year looks like at the end, you know, how it will close. Mm. But um, very quickly we'll be able to see, are we seeing more inflows? And what sort of places are those uh, inflows going? Right now, uh, remittances, about 80% is purely for domestic use, uh, hospital bills, funerals, school fees, rent, that kind of thing. Increasingly, we are hoping to see that 20% that is usually goes to investment um, sort of increasing. We don't think people will stop sending money home to sustain their families. Mm. We don't think that uh, people will stop sending money home for, for burials and so on. Mm. So we expect that the $4 billion that we have seen so far will continue to, um, to hold. What we expect to see is that we make all these other interventions and conversations around investment. Then we will see an increase of, of, of the figure above that. And mm. that ideally would we be expect the new. To Yes. But then I get a sense mm -hmm. that your state department is then tasked with mm -hmm. creating that structure and that framework mm -hmm. that allows the diaspora to invest into. You see, when you talk about diaspora, it's not a homogenous community. Not at the all. People with different backgrounds, different uh, countries they're in, thinking differently. Yes. But they may just want to put in some money into something. Yeah. So. Do you have that structure in place? Do so, you have those investment vehicles? So mm -hmm. somebody who listened and watched those diaspora, so yeah, 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 yeah the submarine, whatever, whatever. So how are you want me to put up a zip line? Okay. I'd like to participate in any of these things. But where do I start? Yeah, where do I start? Yeah. So we are, you're right, we are tasked with creating an incentive framework 
for remittances. So as government, we create the enabling uh, environment, we create the structures, we create the security, and then we engage private sector heavily because it's private sector that ultimately creates these vehicles. So part of my job has been to speak with, well, more traditionally banks and tell them, uh, can you offer better uh, services? Can you offer better accounts? Um, even if it's a simple fixed deposit uh, USD account, can you increase um, the interest rates on this and so on? So on a very basic level, that's some of what we have done. We have spoken with insurance companies and asked them and others, how can you, for example, offer things like um, repatriation insurance and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. But can you structure investment um, opportunities specifically for the diaspora? The people who do real estate have done better. And I think they've been doing it for some time because they're able to work with uh, diasporian types of financing where they're not asking you to show us a, a three, six months pay slip and yeah. the usual requirements they want you to set up a mortgage on. Mm. We have diaspora circles um, and diaspora investment uh, groups mm. in the sense that diasporians have organized themselves around those. And as government, our job then has been to work with, say, the Ministry for Cooperatives mm -hmm. to ensure that the issues that they have setting up circles are uh, continuously being, being resolved and mm. so on. Now, when you speak about some places have, uh, say, a diaspora investment fund. Mm that is then managed mm. by what would ideally be something like the State Department for Diaspora Affairs, mm. where we say, this is a diaspora investment fund, put your money here, and then we're going to do it the way pensions, for example, do it, and we'll yeah. buy up this property and so on. We're not there yet. Is it a direction we will go? We're in the process of creating our diaspora investment strategy. Mm. So by April, we should have April, May, we should have that ready and then we will know what are the different ways to invest. To you have put in money. To, to put in money, but also what are the ways government should engage? How far can government go without mm. A, competing with private sector, mm. but also to offer sufficient security? What's the place mm -hmm. of the Capital Markets Authority? It's, it's right there in it's the middle. Because mm -hmm. you'd have regulated yeah. Yeah. and also maybe unregulated markets, mm -hmm. but regulated yes. markets would give a sense of comfort. Yes. To somebody in the diaspora yeah that you have opened up the doors as capital markets authority yeah. yeah somebody has come in and registered this regulated product yeah and then you're saying mm -hmm. put money in it yeah i know at least that there's somebody else yes who's, who's checking who's checking to make yeah. sure that this guy doesn't run off yes. with my money so the cma becomes a, a critical player for that we've engaged mm -hmm. cma cma is actually one of was actually one of the panelists even in this diaspora investment conference sort of to demystify uh to diaspora what are these other um, investment opportunities that are not real estate, which is where people traditionally have gone. So the CMA spoke mm. about this. Uh, the NSC spoke about this as well and said, these are the different um, structures we've put in place to backstop uh, particularly regulated regulated products, and this is how you can invest. We've engaged the CMA as well. We've, pre we've prepared some materials that we have shared on our, uh, I don't know if it's on our website, but certainly on our social media around what the CMA does and how Kenyans can engage, even through the various online platforms that the CMA has put in place. So these are some of the things that... Um, We've been putting in front of the diaspora and increasingly the feedback that we got and I, I have to accept this and I take it is that the information that we there is a lot of pockets of information in different places that is disaggregated. Mm -hmm. We have to collate it and put it in one place where people can actually see, OK, I have. Um, some money I want to put back home. Here are the real estate options. Here are um, capital markets. Here is money markets. Here is all of these different things and that I can invest in. And then people are a little more educated. What I think will happen is that uh, that portal will give information not just to desperate but to everybody. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing because then it increases all of our financial literacy and helps us as a country become savvier um, investors. Good. Mm -hmm. Let's take a break. It's half past nine. Rosalind Njogu is the principal secretary in the State Department of for Diaspora Affairs in the Ministry of Foreign and Diaspora Affairs the under office. the office of the Prime Cabinet Secretary and Ministry <laughs> of Foreign Thank and you Diaspora very Affairs. Much. <laughs> <laughs> get it? Got Did it. you get it? Mm. So in the conference, mm -hmm. not just this one in Nairobi, but your engagements with Kenyans in the diaspora, you know, yeah. the various places that you've been to, mm -hmm. what do they tell you is their biggest challenge when it comes to investing back home? I think information. Mm -hmm. They don't know what is available. Um, so information is a big one. Uh, and it's not information just around what opportunities are, exist, but also information around what that 
what that structure is going to look like, what taxes I'm going to pay around it, am I going to be taxed about this, where do I get this information? So information is a big one. And if we can avail that information, that becomes a big one. The second issue is a trust issue. So a number of Desporeans have uh, <clears throat> trust concerns around either having lost money to relatives mm. who they have used to invest, which is why it being able then to invest directly becomes uh, critical. Mm. Having the information, the knowledge, and being able to invest directly mm. is important. And that trust is um, in relatives, in um, sometimes they have uh, put money into maybe questionable products or have purchased a house that did not materialize mm. and that so there's a trust issue but the trust issue i think is 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 exacerbated by the fact that being away from home uh maybe seeing negative uh news reports constantly makes you an edge mm. uh, and so you you we a big part of my job in this one last year has just been trust building. Mm. How do you get people uh, not just to trust government, but to trust home, mm. to think that <laughs> not all their uncles are, you know, out to necessarily um, <laughs> get their hard-earned right. money and so on. And, and uh, in many ways, just soothe uh, fears, deal with um, or escalate to the right offices, uh, cases where we've actually had people lose money and so on. So mm. providing information and and trust have been the two big two big concerns hmm. mm -hmm. so this is interesting because the links we can make between mm -hmm. comfortability of those living in the diaspora mm -hmm. and then the investments that they make back home mm -hmm. when you were last year one of the projects that you were embarking on was mm -hmm. really going to different centers to make sure that there are certain things mm -hmm. that they need that yeah. they get yes. passports was yes. one of them making sure that they're you know mm. um have all the documentation that yes. they need and yeah. having to come all the way back home yeah. to get some of those sorted out. That state of comfortability yeah. usually will determine yeah. what you will do when it comes to investment. Yeah. How has that transition, you know, progressed yeah. over the last couple of months? I'm so happy you ask because the the this first year, we just celebrated a year, I think today's a year 15 days since um, I took office. Mm. We just celebrated a year as a State Department. And looking back, one of the things that we are really proud of is just how much we've been able to get out to offer mobile consular services. Mm. So um, having Desperians not have to travel thousands of miles to the embassy to get an ID, passport, birth certificate, and so on, was one of the things that the president said, get this done. Mm. So in the last one year, we've been to 22 countries, we've done 100 cities, um, taking services directly to the people without counting the services that we've offered within the embassies. Um, and that means we've taken passports, we've taken IDs, we've taken birth certificates. Uh, in some cases where we have a lot of undocumented children, uh, we've had to do a DNA. I had to send a team that does uh, DNA sampling between it's parents and the child. Me. What's an undocumented child? Where people have had children um, and because of the legal system in that particular country, uh, they cannot have those children because they are um, <coughs> unwed mothers or they've had these children outside of wedlock and in these countries it is illegal to have children outside of wedlock you would go to jail for an offense called morals mm. so there are countries like that yes so because of that we've had a number of children born um, in homes or therefore they're undocumented they don't have uh, paperwork mm. We cannot just issue paperwork indiscriminately because mm. this is how you traffic You've people. Got to prove. You yes. have to know that you're Kenyan. So mm. what the State Department did then is because every child who is born of a Kenyan has a right to documentation. Whether born in Kenya or abroad. Or abroad, yeah. yes. Uh, if you have one Kenyan parent, then you have uh, the right to Kenyan citizenship. What then we did was send out a team that collected DNA sample between one parent, the parent and the child. Um, match that DNA. If that matches, then we go back and issue the documentation to sort of regularize that child. Mm. So that now that child has their birth certificate, their passport, um, they can leave that country if they wanted to leave that country because until this point they cannot leave and mm. somehow they can access services within that country because now they have the paperwork for it. They can go to school and so on. So this is one of the things that we've been able to do most recently and it's been very, very successful. Mm. Um, and, and 
And so in stabilizing that consular situation, only then can you have conversations with people about, do you want to invest? Can yes. you invest? So, But you can't speak to people about investing if they cannot go to school. Absolutely. They can't access medical. So the first year has been to set up a very firm foundation that um, assures diaspora that we are here to protect their rights and welfare. Uh, and so that has been uh, the biggest spend on our budget, but that was, has been the biggest spend in terms of uh, human resource, in terms of just ensuring that that issue is stabilized. We've been able to go to the 22 countries that I mentioned. There are places that I have promised uh, to send a team and we haven't yet managed to, but we hope to clean up in the first uh, part of 2024. And then now having done that, you can begin to move. And I've begun to shift the conversation into now that we are not um, talking about distressed migrant workers, now that we're not talking about uh, domestic workers uh, who have been abused, who, where, we constantly, where we used to constantly see videos on, mm. uh, on social media and so on. Now that that matter is to a large extent stable, mm. And we have assured you that we are here to support you. We are here to offer services. We um, did a fantastic evacuation of Kenyans out of Sudan mm -hmm. uh, as soon as the war broke out. Um, we were actually, apart from um, Egypt that shares a border with Sudan, we were the first country to get our citizens home mm -hmm. before anybody else. Something we are very proud of because we worked our team worked very hard to just get snatch people out of the, f the fire, so to speak. Mm. Um, so we're able to do that. We've evacuated Kenyans from Israel and uh, Gaza. Mm. Uh, so the, as I said, big part of the job was to confirm to Kenyans that we are here to work for you. We support you. If you are away from home and you see, you know, that flag waving, mm. we have come for you. Mm. Um, so, so now with that foundation very clearly settled or very firmly settled with engaging, engaging people with respect mm. um, and dignity and rescuing people who are in bad situations, then now we can have conversations about now um, what can we do for you in terms of ensuring a better future for you. Now mm. that you have found jobs and now that you're able to work because you have documentation, can we then speak about mm. investments? Can we then speak about diaspora opening up trade routes where, uh, where they live in terms of being able to push Kenyan products, whether it's our coffee, tea, nuts and whatever other value chains that we are looking to um, <coughs> or we are working to, to develop? Can we speak about uh, diaspora uh, transferring skills, knowledge and expertise? Um, and can we talk about diaspora then helping other Kenyans find opportunities abroad? Mm -hmm. But that conversation couldn't be had until we had stabilized the foundation. What would you have wanted to do by now mm -hmm. that you have not been able to do and why? Create a better incentive um, framework for remittances. Mm. Because we needed to do what I've just explained. Mm -hmm. mm. With I, th I think going in, we sort of figured this is something, it's a quick kill. We can finish this. We can. But what has happened in the first one year is that it took a lot of time mm. to build trust. Mm. It took a lot of time to deliver services to people. It took a lot of time to just set up. It, the setting up of a state department is not for the weak of heart. Mm. <laughs> it, is, <laughs> it is harder work than, <laughs> than it looks like setting up. Uh, um, I have done a few startups, <laughs> but this one has been a startup like no other. It is, it's also setting up the right culture, um, mm -hmm. leading a team, uh, bringing, it's setting up a business that already has existing clients that are everywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. And figuring out how do I reach um, uh, Kenyans in, in Australia uh, who are awake at the wrong time, <laughs> as far as we are concerned, you know, and so on. Mm. And, and that has taken some time. But I'm very happy with what we've been able to do in terms of consular services and welfare. I'm very happy with what we've been able to achieve. Mm. I'm happy with what we've been able to achieve in terms of helping Kenyans find jobs abroad. Um, next year's or the next few years, the four things that we're going to be focusing on are now really lighting a fire under the diaspora investments, as I spoke about, mm -hmm. is um, jobs, 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 mm -hmm. helping Kenyans find opportunities, good opportunities, safe opportunities abroad. It's going to be about uh, skills, knowledge, and technology transfer. Mm -hmm. So we want now to, now that we have secured a uh, relationship mm -hmm. with people, we want to understand what is this cutting-edge research 
that you've been working on in Wuhan. Mm. We have some Kenyans in Wuhan who've been doing cutting edge research. Mm. What is this cutting edge research you've been working on, whether it is in COVID or whatever, and how can we as a country gain from that? What is this a fantastic way of thinking around privatization uh, or other models that you've been working on that we can tap into? Mm. What is this that you've learned about cancer treatment um, mm. or educating children or supporting people with learning disabilities? What are all these fantastic things that you're learning, that you have learned, that you have developed out there, and how can we as your home take advantage of that? So mm. those three, um, and then I talked about the jobs, the investment, the technology transfer, and trade routes. Mm. Those are the four things now we'll be focusing on going uh, forward now that the fo Wealth, Welfare Foundation is... is how organized are these diaspora groups? That's a good question. So... Well, how well very, organized? Very, very organized and not at all, mm -hmm. right? So it is both. So we mm -hmm. have more than a thousand uh, different diaspora uh, groups, mm -hmm. right? And they are uh, in different sizes. There are some of them apples and all, in the sense that in some places you have an umbrella association. So Kifua, for example, is a Kenyans in France uh, umbrella association. So <laughs> Kifua is um, okay. an, an association that brings together various other associations mm. within France, right? So you see that as one association and you can engage directly through that association. But within France, you will still find uh, associations uh, sort of uh, around people who come from Nyamira, mm. uh, or you will find lawyers who've gathered together, or uh, Kenyans who do this kind of business, Kenyan women in business in, in France, Kenyans who are concerned about supporting each other around um, death and bereavement. So you mm. have all of it. Different we, we are people who do chamas everywhere we yep. are, and, yep. we, and that's a good thing. Let me tell you where I'm going with yeah. this. Huh? We have special packages for people who want to invest in the country. Yes. Okay, we have an export uh, free zone, mm -hmm. whatever they are it's called, EPZ, yes, yes, that one. And a special economic zone. That one. Mm -hmm. And then we also tell people want to come and invest. We'll do this for you, mm -hmm. we'll do this for yeah. you, we'll do this for you now. Yeah. If our brothers and sisters in the diaspora are organized, yeah. is it then possible for similar incentives Absolutely. to be offered to them. For Absolutely. instance, we've been told the government wishes to have people invest in yeah. certain parasitical organizations, mm -hmm. not necessarily sell, mm -hmm. but invest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Offers such as that one, because mm -hmm. these will be organizations mm -hmm. they are familiar with, mm -hmm. so that the offer is made to them. Yeah. We've already established they have money, yeah. because they send it and we see it. Mm -hmm. Now, if it is packaged in the groups that they are in, and some of these incentives that are offered to others, if it was offered to them, first of all, is it possible? If it was possible, what hinders it from being? So that the issue of our brothers and sisters in the diaspora mm -hmm. talking about the country, not perhaps giving them the priority it should, is also now taken care of so that it is clear yeah. that they are given priority. So when yeah. you talk about foreign investors, yeah. we talk about them because mm. they are in foreign Talk lands. about mm -hmm. domestic investors in foreign, foreign lands. countries. Thank so you very it's much. It's very it's well the diaspora direct investment. It's mm. DDI. DDI. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so are you spot on? You're spot on in terms of the the products or the incentives exist and they exist in these packets and we usually think of them as FDI, right? How do we incentivize foreign direct investment? How so now it's a question of how do you incentivize DDI, mm. which is what I mentioned. Part of the things that we are working on is the investment strategy that we expect to be cooked, uh, cooked, right? By mm. April, mm. right? To be ready, ready. <laughs> <laughs> to be ready, I'm rounding off to the nearest mother tongue <laughs> by um, <laughs> by April. Um, but apart from that, uh, there is nothing at all that stops them from receiving the incentives that that you have described. Uh, it is really our part, and I think this ties into your question earlier mm. of what it is that what do I think I should have been able to achieve that we haven't been able to achieve. This is now where we are going. This mm. is where the emphasis in the next um, in 2024 is going to be very heavily on. How do we structure, how do we prepare ourselves and the diaspora for this handshaking as far as investment is, is concerned? Um, 
a number of things already exist like you said there's um special economic zones and a special economic zones authority will tell you we have a special economic zone in such and such a place particularly for developing uh, the leather value chain and mm. so on and nothing stops us from telling diaspora this information is there it all starts with the information as you said earlier there is need for us to invest in the leather value chain, for example. My understanding is that currently our leather value chain is about 20 billion um, and can grow. We're looking to grow to 120B. Mm. For us to do that, we have to make certain investments in tanneries and so on and so forth, but also investment in feedlots and ensuring that people are feeding their animals right, taking care of their animals right, uh, ensuring that we are teaching people how to flay. Is it called flaying? To flay the animal mm, so that mm, when you mm, when you mm, kill mm. the animal, you're removing the hide without damaging it. Yeah. But also just creating the infrastructure around that. So now with the, it's about bringing together the pieces. We have the information piece here. Diaspora can invest uh, in this already set out zones, in these already structured things. It's for us now as the SDDA to basically help them shepherd them to these spaces and say mm. here is how you can handshake as far as the special economic zones are concerned and so mm. on mm. we might not even need to create anything anything new it's just aggregate the already existing what, what already is there exactly and then tweak it a little bit so that it is diaspora facing okay yeah yes i am mm. sure yeah or at least i hope that in the one year that you've been in office yeah there have been diaspora groups mm -hmm. that have come with ideas yes. of what they'd like to do yeah. and what they're just looking for is a bit of hand-holding yeah. through government corridors. Yes. What are those and how are you taking those ideas mm -hmm. into formulating these new structures that you're putting in place? Excellent. So we've done a number of those. Some of them will be we are uh, developing this huge uh, property in... Mavoko or in Machakos, and what we need is help getting power okay. to come to the property. Then we do the, the hand-holding. We speak uh, to the relevant ministry mm. and are able to direct because our job is to actually harness the investments and facilitate. So we do mm. that. Uh, sometimes all they want is quite simply, can you come and quote and quote bless this project? Mm. Uh, yesterday, mm. I drove a forklift. I did not drive it. Mm. I someone was operated. driving it and then they, I operated, they told thank you, you yes. which Move is this which one. is difficult <laughs> which is unbelievably difficult i cannot be i cannot believe how difficult it is to work a forklift mm. i i was very anyway so one of the diaspora groups yesterday was breaking ground on a 1000 unit um affordable housing project mm -hmm. in um off Kamiti road in mirema mm -hmm. um and all they wanted is PS, can you come for our groundbreaking? Mm. Sometimes it's just that sense of we want government, one, to recognize what we are doing mm. and to support us. Mm. So I have been to a few of those groundbreakings or, you know, key, key handing over, whatever, and so on. Mm. Some are, we, we think there is something to be done between this and this. Can you help us with one to three offices? Can you help us with CBK as, when, as, we, as we sort out um, our license so that we can offer remittances at a cheaper rate mm -hmm. to diaspora? So all of those, we take them in. Of course, there's a process of due diligence to make sure that also we are not hand-holding crooks yeah. throughout, yeah. throughout government uh, corridors. Um, but we do a lot of that. Are uh, you saying there's no... You see, all those things that you're talking about, the, just at the idea stage, yeah. or the output of the investment conference, mm -hmm. there's no group or individual mm -hmm. or two people who have yeah. come and said, we think mm -hmm. that this is how the government can actually set up a structure mm -hmm. that attracts diaspora oh, money that into this yeah. particular vehicle yeah. that then goes to invest in something. Yeah. No, that we have had. Like, that we've had. Like we had a number of uh, different Kenyans come and say, this is how we think you could um, make a little more slick the remittances conversation and so on. So what we've done with that group is put them in a technical working group, right, so that they can hash out these ideas and we have something uh, coherent. Mm -hmm. and, there's, and then that then informs the diaspora investment strategy that I spoke about. So we have that. Mm -hmm. We have things at different levels and it's both ways it's sometimes it's diaspora coming with an idea uh and once we have once we've set up our uh technology skills and information um 
knowledge transfer piece it's going to be a little more um, structured but sometimes it's diaspora coming with an idea sometimes it's easy enough we take it we run with it sometimes it requires some hand holding sometimes it means i need to move that uh, conversation to a different ministry and then you know they support it and and they run with it so that that we do mm. still in a bit of a uh, ad hoc manner mm. because you have to figure out how do we harvest all of these ideas it's almost as if you need a basket to harvest <laughs> the ideas and then put them in a particular um we are very uh, good with task forces sorry <laughs> just set up a task force <laughs> and bring in diaspora uh-huh. leaders from various you know yes. representing various sectors and various yes. industries yes and then tell them you guys workshop it yeah workshop it and then mm-hmm. be a sponge yeah it's pick a your ideas now. and yeah. now yes. think <laughs> yes. workshop is a workshop verb, is a verb. Yeah. create yeah. create this platform <laughs> yeah from your own context yeah then tell us this is what the government should do yeah instead of you being the owner of everything mm. absolutely I, i i agree i agree with that and i think working to um it's almost as if to you want diaspora to be the the solvers the drivers and the, the drivers and the solution. solvers of this particular of, this of solutions yeah. and put them in groups so that you're able to say the people who are interested in this particular problem here she will need workshop mm, it okay. um yeah. and let's move I, i i completely agree with that what i was going to say is that we also see it the other way around mm-hmm. where we have people walk into our office and say can you help us access markets in the diaspora can you help us think through how we can um make our products a little more diaspora facing that has been banks for example the come and say we've been running this product for quite some time mm. we don't think we're getting it quite right mm. can you and some can your team help us think through how we can sharpen this so that yeah. it answers so we've been able to do that as well mm. we've had uh, coffee cooperatives come to our office and say can you help us find access to market in the diaspora using mm. the diaspora and we've also been able to make those linkages so it's a uh, we are finding ourselves in with our fingers in a lot of uh, pies mm. we're finding ourselves as a a meeting room or something like that where yeah. a lot of pieces are moving mm. um so it, maybe w- next year when we do this again <laughs> i'll be able to tell you what we've been able to how we've been able to figure out the um, task forces yeah. around various issues and how we've been able, able to work out some of these some Thanks. of these kinks so let's yeah. maybe step out a little bit yeah. uh, again um what progress has been made or rather does it fall under you mm-hmm. whereby you kind of have an idea of where kenyans are mm-hmm. around the world mm-hmm. and working in tandem with different embassies or high mm-hmm. commissions in mm-hmm. different countries yeah. because those are sometimes issues mm-hmm. that you may get a distress call for somebody who you did not know resided in this mm. uh, particular country yeah. and that um, was something that you mentioned last time mm-hmm. so in terms of progress whether now by there's documenting of kenyans when mm-hmm. they get to the country where they are going mm-hmm. how is that going so that remains a sticking point mm-hmm. it is we've made some progress mm-hmm. in attempting to map uh, where kenyans are it is still a sticky issue mm. um because our system is still very much voluntary mm. right so we still uh, ask kenyans mm. if th- there isn't a mandatory um please come and register with no, us no yeah mm. it's more and and um diasporians and not just the kenyan diaspora but diasporas i have learned around the world have over the years been suspicious of their governments and i don't know why i think someone who sort of mm. sort of has no, done why? studies into deep deep diaspora studies will be able to tell us mm. so the approach has been and i learned this from um from ireland for example is what you try to do then is you go where they are mm. go where they are if they're running a um, cultural event go there offer mm. services build trust and then let people let come to you. you let, let them, them see, see you you mean no harm mm. yes You come in peace. I come in peace and I bring goodies. <laughs> oh, I come in peace and I bring Christmas. goodies. And I will be here for you. <laughs> yes. If you ever need me. Yes. Exactly. Rosalind, thank you very much for joining us today. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Rosalind Jogu is the principal secretary for Diaspora Affairs. She's been our guest talking about the investment opportunities for Kenyans in the diaspora. This is the Situation Room. The only way to start your day.